evening. Our speaker this evening is Joe Boggs with OSU Extension Hamilton County and the OSU Department of Entomology. And Joe works for Amy Stone. So welcome, Joe. <laughs> and we look forward to your presentation. Well, you know, I don't think Amy's on yet, so she oh, have to, we may have to go back and uh, and do that again. <laughs> or do that. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Well, I do appreciate uh, getting to talk with all of you this evening and uh, just the opportunity to talk about something that's kind of very near and dear to my heart. And hopefully, you know, by the time we're finished, uh, it will be the same for you. So understanding and even appreciating tree galls, and we may go a little further than just tree galls. We'll be talking about these structures and some other things as well. Galls are weird things. They're misunderstood things. And I actually do consider galls to be a mind-blowing thing. Once you learn what's going on, it's a pretty incredible thing that's happening. Well, full disclosure. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Joe Boggs, and I am a gallaholic. I just want to let you know right off the bat, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, in Ohio, you know, my favorite uh, town is uh, Gallopolis. Uh, you know, uh, here in Cincinnati, we have Gallinitis, and Gallopolis literally means land of the Gauls. So it's an, an incredible Gallia and Gallopolis, a place is named for Gauls. I, I think I have that spelled correctly. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No man is a Gaul Island is what I'm saying. And so that's kind of the whole idea. Well, my first point this evening is perception versus reality. You know, this is the perception of Gauls, that they're highly destructive. I mean, look at these Gauls bending this tree over, this oak tree just about to fall. Now, yes, they can. These Gauls can be huge, crushing cars. I mean, look at this one. It not only felt, you know pulled the tree over, but it crushed a car. That's the perception. But the reality with plant galls, tree galls specifically, is they are the most obvious and least damaging of any abnormal plant growth found on trees and other plants. Let that sink in just a little bit. Very obvious, but least damaging. So my second gall point, where does the term gall come from in the first place? There are many meaning, meanings, and if you have a taste for Latin or German, gallo is Proto-German, so you know the, uh, the you know the linguists would say, okay, this was the language that led to more modern German, and Gallo meant bitter-tasting bile, you know, the liver secretion. A Gallo in Latin was oak gall or a lump on a plant. It's possibly derived from the bitter taste of oak galls. We'll get to that in just a minute. Now, if you look at the history of all this, it's unclear, at least to me, at any rate, whether or not. You know, the Romans borrowed the term from uh, uh, the Germanic tribes or if the Germanic tribes picked it up from the Romans as they were visiting and getting along real well, right? Uh, I kind of think it is the, I, personally, I kind of believe that's probably the Romans picked it up from the uh, Proto-Germans because uh, this, this term was used in the, like all the way back in the fifth century BC. So that's kind of my thinking, but I could be wrong about that. There are many meanings for gall, painful swelling or sore spot on a horse, impudence, brazenness of all the gall, you've heard that saying, great misery or physical suffering that's derived from tasting bitter bile or to suffer an injury. That's kind of an interesting meaning for gall. I mean, if we take a look, for example, at Shakespeare, you know, stand by or I shall gall you, Falcon Bridge. And in, in, in this case, gall means to inflict injury. And you can see, I mean, look at this. I mean, look at the armament they're using there. This is why gall got that name, I think, uh, you know, used to beat up people. Well, as a matter of fact, this whole bitterness associated with it comes from gallic acid in oak galls. It makes them taste bitter like, you know, the gall in, you know, uh, from the gallbladder. And Europeans called the structures we see on oaks and other, they call them gall nuts. Now, here's a term that you will not see much at all in the US. You'll see it in Europe. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna do something here to just hide the floating controls that might get in the way here. Um, so at any rate, if you take a look at this sesodology, it's Greek for the study of gall nuts and a branch of science dealing with insect and mite plant galls. 
Oops, hang on just for a second. Uh, things have to catch up. All right, hang on. Let me just back out for just a minute. Okay. This happens sometimes. So back to Cecidology, it's a branch of science dealing with insect and mite plant galls. Is that a gall nut? No, no, that's a buckeye. But you won't hear much about Cecidology again in the United States. Uh, in Europe, there are departments, you know, departments of Cecidology. But in the United States, the, studies of, the study of galls are primarily relegated, frankly, sometimes to biological sciences, sometimes entomology, so different departments. Gallic acid is a pretty, I, I think, a, 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 an intriguing compound, 3,4,5-trihydroxybenzoic acid. It's not just found in galls, the gall nuts. It's also found in sumac, witch hazel, tea leaves, oak bark, and other plants. Uh, it's not the same as tannic acid, uh, but they do have some similar qualities. And gallic acid is closely related to gall ink. Some of you may have heard of this, gall ink. It's not a stain. That's very important. Blueberries, I love blueberries. And, you know, if you eat blueberries, that blue can transfer. I mean, I end up, if I'm eating a whole handful, you get them around your mouth, you get them on your hands. That's a transference of color. That is a stain. Gallic, uh, gall ink is not a stain. It's a dye. And dyes typically involve a chemical reaction, two or more chemicals that react to produce colors. If you've ever done any dyeing, uh, you know, way back in the day, you know, tie dyeing and that sort of thing. I was always very surprised that very often the dyes came, you know, in 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 these containers. You looked at the the precursors that you'd mix together, and one may be clear, the other may be slightly yellowish in color. I mean, just nothing at all like it says it's going to be blue. You mix them together though, and enter cotton to the equation, and you start getting a dye. And that's what gall ink is. So here's a good example. This is an oak plum gall. Now we're gonna talk about this a little more, but the vast majority of tree galls cause no harm to their hosts. You can see in this case, it's just coming off the acorn cap. It's dramatic looking, kind of looks like a bloodshot eyeball. And as a matter of fact, at the end of the season, he starts dropping off the oak trees. And you know, if you have a yard full of bloodshot eyeballs laying around, that's pretty dramatic. But if you bring in my pocket knife, which is 440M stainless, made up of 80% iron, and the rest chromium and carbon and, and uh, manganese. But it's the iron that I really want to focus on because just a little bit of iron that comes off this knife when I cut this gall open, after about 15 minutes, notice the color change. And that's not oxidation. That's actually a dye chemical reaction between a little bit of transference of iron and the gallic acid. And it makes a rich kind of a blue-black ink that you've all seen, whether you knew it or not. Because our history is literally written in gall ink. Da Vinci drew, uh, drew with it. So you've noticed, you ever notice how all of his drawings had this kind of a, 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 a little bit of a reddish black or just a very un, unusual looking color? Rembrandt and Van, Gro and Van Gogh drew with it. Bach composed with it. Important documents like the Magna Carta and our U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights, at least a couple of versions of the Constitution, were written in gall ink. There's a downside to it, though, because it is gallic acid. You'll probably hear, you know, some historians uh, talking about reading the holes in ancient and old documents. Well, because it had it, it can be a you know concocted straight from gall uh, gall uh, gallic acid. Uh, gall ink can be very acidic and it can start destroying the, you know, whatever it's written on. And so it leaves behind holes. On the other hand, what's really interesting is all these folks on here, Da Vinci, apparently uh, Rembrandt and Van Gogh, Bach, all of the people involved here use a recipe that would uh, neutralize the acid. So that's why you can still see Da Vinci's drawings without them being eaten through the page. But now, bottom line is, if you think of gall ink, I mean, again, that's another blind, mind-blowing feature of galls, in my opinion. My third gall ink point, is it a gall or is it something else like a bracket fungus or a canker? 
yeah, what are these things? Are these galls? No, these are burls. And we don't know what causes them. You know, this burl is on black walnut, pretty common on black walnut. Woodworkers love burls. Uh, this is on, on a Kwanzan cherry. This is on an oak. Uh, we're not sure what causes these. We do know they're not caused by a gall maker, but we're not sure exactly what causes them to form, but they are not galls. Is this a gall or just a crazy guy? No, this is a bracket fungus, and it's a fruiting structure of a fungus. Kind of think a little bit like an apple. So some of you know Jim Chatfield up your way, uh, just retired last year from OSU Extension, but still very active. And, and so he is, you know, touching hands to a bracket fungus called Polyporous qualmosis. That's a scientific name. We always like to break down scientific names when we can. Polyporous means many pores. That's where the spores come out of here. And squamosis means scaly. Another common name or a common name for this particular bracket fungus is dryad saddle, uh, which I find kind of fascinating because tree spirits that are depicted as uh, nymphs, as female nature deities, that's what dryads are. So the idea is that, you know, these are places where dryads will sit upon the, the tree. And yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I actually kind of think, well, maybe it's a little bit more in the minds of, uh, of lonely lumberjacks. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, Bracket fungi, these are not galls. Crack cap polypore, for example, very common, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on black locust. Now that's not a gall. Uh, Ganoderma is another uh, 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 bracket fungus. Uh, gotta be a little careful with this. And all these bracket fungi indicate interior wood decay, but some of the fungi are more aggressive than others. Ganoderma, for example, is pretty aggressive, but these are not galls. What about a canker? A canker is a symptom of an infection. This is something to keep in mind. Most often it's a pathogenic fungus that is digesting the phloem tissue. So you can see some of these cankers can be very large, some not so large like this Bottosphoria canker uh, on red bud. Again, you know, cankers means that you have an infection and then digestion of plant tissue, in this case, phloem tissue. So here is a plant gall definition. A plant gall is an abnormal plant structure involving plant tissues that only develops and grows when the plant is colonized by, and this is very important, a living gall maker, such as certain insects, mites, nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Abnormal plant structures that are constructed of plant tissues colonized by a living gall maker. So abnormal plant structures, now we're not talking about uh, abnormal plants on structures or abnormal use of plant structures, but they are in fact abnormal plant structures. I mean, who would expect this pine cone-like structure to occur on willow? Look at that. Look at all these. I mean, it looks like pine cones on a willow. That's certainly abnormal. And of course you open it up and since there's gonna be a living gall maker involved, you will find the living gall maker. In this case, it's gonna be a midge fly maggot inside that gall. So plant cankers means death of plant tissue. A plant gall means growth of plant tissue. It's very important to keep that in mind. So what kind of organisms cause galls? Well, insects and mites and microorganisms like nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. We're going to focus primarily uh, on <coughs> the insect and mite gall makers, which collectively we call arthropod galls. And here are the dominant arthropod gall makers. By far, hymenoptera, wasps and, and, and some sawflies, uh, then we followed by the diptera, the midge flies, then the hemipterans, aphids and phylloxerans and psyllids. And really the only mites that produce galls are the areophyids. <clears throat> and many of you, I mean, I can speak for myself, but I mean, the very first tree gall I ever came across that was called a gall uh, was actually this one. It's a uh, uh, maple spindle gall, or some people call it maple nail gall. Or if it wasn't this one, it may have been maple bladder gall, the little red bladder-like structure. So areophyids do create some very interesting galls. But there are over 2,000 species of insect gall makers, so we're going to shift out of mites. 
And I'm really not going to go back to Area 5s. You know, they produce such a diverse range of galls. They almost deserve a, a presentation by themselves. I'm kind of angling for that now. I think you probably see because I, this could be a series. I mean, you'd all just become gall maniacs with me. But there are 2,000 species of insect gall makers in the U.S. Three-fourths <clears throat> belong to only two families, though. The wasps, the family of Cynipidae. And so sometimes you'll hear that's a cynipid gall. That's where that comes from. It's a wasp belonging to that family. And midge flies belonging to the family Cessidomyidae. Well, where have you seen that before? Cessido means gall. And so Cessidomyidae, these are the midge flies that produce galls. And here's another little interesting <clears throat> tidbit that can help you with identification. There are about 800 different gall makers on oaks. And over 700 of those are wasps. So if you came across these galls on an oak tree, if you had to guess, what's the gall maker? And if you guessed, you know, wasp galls, you'd be right about 85% of the time, somewhere around that, 87, I think, percent of the time. But that's pretty good odds, isn't it? So let's drill down a little further on some descriptive terms. And the reason I'm bringing these up is because <clears throat> It is important. Sometimes people say, well, that's going too deep. Well, if you're describing to me a gall, it's important to understand the words used to describe that gall. But more importantly, it's amazing how often people will, you know, like send a picture of a gall to me and they'll just send a picture of the gall without cutting it open. I would urge when you come across a gall, you know, take a a knife, be careful, cut it open. Sometimes if they're woody, you might have to use <clears throat> a pair of clippers. But my point is, is cut it open and see what's inside. So for example, some galls have only one chamber in there. Uh, unilocular, locular is from the Latin loculus, meaning little place. Others have multiple chambers, plurilocular. And then each of those chambers uh, uh, may have <clears throat> one or more occupants. Unilarval means one, multilarval means more than one. So for example, hawthorn pod galls. Again, if you just sit this, you know, just looked at this picture and say, oh, that's interesting. But what's inside is important. So you open it up, you find there's one chamber with a lot of larvae. So it's unilocular, but many occupants, multilarval. If we look at a mossy rose gall, very common on, on roses, doesn't really cause any harm. I think it adds ornamental value, but I might be a little biased. If we open it up, we'll see there are many chambers, so it's, it's plurilocular, with only one occupant per chamber. I mean, look at that. See there, they're all looking back at you, only one per chamber. So let's dig a little deeper into these and look at this hickory phylloxerin gall, for example. And a couple of things about galls is if you do have, to, I mean, whatever's developing inside much get, must get outside. <clears throat> so there's always some exit, right? I mean, that just stands to reason. And that's part of the gall structure. Early on, this is closed up because there's no need for the immature phylloxerans to go in and out. But then as they mature to adults, it starts opening up, a little exit sign drops down, so they know where to go. This is a unilocular, right? It only has one chamber, but multilarval. This one's a creepy larval. I don't know what that is. So how do galls form? And this is where things start, I think, getting the most interesting about galls. I mean, it's one thing to look at them and say, oh, this is an unusual structure, but exactly how do they come about? Well, there are two perspectives. One is that galls arise uh, from a plant irritation. The plant's irritated and then uh, induces, a, the gall maker induces a plant defense response. Another perspective is that its galls arise by directed growth. The plant growth is under the direction of a living gall maker. Now, I would say that, and well, let's just drill down on these, you know. Okay, and an irritation. <clears throat> well, that's an irritation, right? Uh, a plant irritant that induces a plant defense. And by the way, I, that's in my contract with Ohio State. I have to, to reference U of M at some point. So an irritation. Now, I actually believe there are very few galls that arise through a plant irritation uh, relationship. <clears throat> Some do. I think the goldenrod ball gall produced by a little uh, midge fly 
uh, is kind of the poster child for this. Uh, because you open it up and you'll find that embedded inside is going to be a maggot, a midge fly larva, and there's not much structure here. And you can plain and simply just kind of see where, you know, the gall maker just simply started disrupting plant, you know, growth. And, and so you just kind of got this swelling, um, not, not a whole lot of direction going on there. But now let's look at directed plant growth. And what I believe to be, as I said earlier, uh, what makes galls so fascinating. So in this case, for example, we're gonna look at an oak apple gall, a wasp gall, and the outside, okay, that looks a little bit like that, <clears throat> that uh, goldenrod ball gall, doesn't it? Except you open it up and my goodness, the structure is much more intricate. I think you'd have to agree. And inside is this gall maker that is directing gall growth. So here are the steps. <clears throat> where you do have directed growth, here are the steps. First, it starts with a female initiating gall formation by injecting chemicals while she's laying the eggs. These are little tiny wasps. These are sinipid wasps in this case. Uh, they have little ovipositors, which you, know, you could call a stinger, but they're not used for defense. When she inserts the ovipositor, she inserts also some chemicals. And then the eggs exude chemicals from their surface that continues to direct gall formation. And as things move along, even the larvae, most usually the early instars, the very young larvae, continue to exude chemicals. Now, what are they doing? And to me, this is just a big news. Those chemicals that are produced by the gall maker, they are turning plant genes on and off at just the right time to direct the growth of the gall. And this is important. It's not being, the, the, the plant's not being genetically modified. We're not talking about GMOs here because the plant genes are already there. It's just the gall maker is able to adjust the selection of those genes by chemicals that turn them on and off so they can direct what they want the plant to do. Now that is mind blowing. I think you all have to agree with that. It's almost miraculous. Some more inside information. So let's, let's look at this translucent oak gall. This is where things to me get really fascinating. Remember, this is induced, it is directed by a wasp and it, that wasp will only produce this gall. You open it up and you see, well, there's some interesting things inside, including the immature wasp that has chewing mouth parts. Now, I'm putting this in here because one time, I mean, this is early on. I mean, again, when I first started becoming interested in plant galls and tree galls specifically, you know, there were a few things that <clears throat> I didn't think about. Like, for example, this is a wasp larva that has chewing mouth parts. What does it eat? And, uh, you know, when I first asked myself that question, I started, you know, looking at galls. Well, I didn't see that this thing was just eating the whole gall in there. Instead, <laughs> it's the female gall maker started this process. It continued with the egg and it continued with the larva. It is surrounded by what's called nutrient tissue. So this nutrient tissue is what the immature wasp eats. It's just sitting in there, and as it consumes this nutrient tissue, and I get the laser, as it consumes it, the plant continues to replace it. I mean, think about that. That's sort of like that's sort of like sitting around at home and imagine you're sitting there in your Barker lounger and pizzas are flying out of the wall. I mean, that's exactly what's going on here. And again, remember that it is the wasp that directed the plant to produce this tissue by turning genes on and off at just the right time to make this develop. Of course, eventually that immature wasp with chewing mouth parts will chew a hole towards the surface and then the mature new wasp will emerge. So let's finally understand galls. And you know, the truth is out there. That's the main point. You can see this all the time if you look closely. Some gall truths. First of all, to reiterate, galls are constructed of plant tissue. I'm going to go with a, uh, 
uh, called Grape Tomato Gall or Tumid Gall, uh, produced by Midge Fly. <clears throat> and here's an oak lobed gall produced by a wasp. This is all plant tissue. This isn't the gall maker. And it's hijacked plant tissue. So if we look at the tomato gall, for example, on grape, I mean, here we have, you know, what soon will be the grapes. You know, soon those will, those are the grape berries, soon turn into grapes. But if it gets hijacked, look what happens. Those berries, what would have been grapes, turn into gall structures. You open them up and inside you'll find the little gall making larvae. Gall tissue is plant tissue, but what kind? It is functional plant tissue. If it's green, that gall is actually, the cells are, are, are helping the plant through photosynthesis. That does occur with these galls. As a matter of fact, I don't know of any studies to measure this, but I suspect there could be enough sugars produced through photosynthesis on the surface of these galls to perhaps actually support the gall maker without causing any stress to the plant. That's a suspicion I have. And gall tissue can be infected plant tissue. Just to demonstrate that that gall tissue is plant tissue, if we look, for example, at the succulent, let me go back, I, I went past. So here is a succulent oak gall. It's hollow inside. And the gall maker in, in this uh, gall is actually inside this little roly-poly structure that moves around. I often wonder if the wasp comes out if it just kind of staggers around for a few days. But the point being is, this is oak anthracnose infecting an oak leaf. Here we have oak anthracnose infecting the roly-poly gall because the roly-poly gall is the same tissue as the leaf. Here we can see a more up close. Here's hawthorn pod galls you've already seen. And you can see on the surface is cedar hawthorn rust fungus spore structures, just like you would see on the surface of the leaf. Because as a matter of fact, this is leaf tissue. If we look at the willow pine cone gall, look on the surface, you see these rust structures, just like you would see on the underside of a willow leaf, because this entire structure is leaf tissue. So now we're gonna really go into some gall, some other gall truths. There are normal plant structures produced under the direction of living gall makers. Galls do not arise spontaneously. It's not a response to wounding or chemicals that do not involve a gall maker. Like this isn't a gall maker. If you hit a tree, you know, and the tree responds with wound tissue, that's not gall making. So plant growths, once again, abnormal plant growths with a living gall maker, like these hackberry nipple galls, there are the adults that induce and direct the, uh, the growth of these galls. So how do insects form plant galls? I mean, I talked about it a little bit, but let's really dig into it a little further because I already told you that they turn plant genes on and off. However, those plant genes must be in tissue that can change. A leaf, for example, once it's locked down, once that leaf is fully expanded, there, there's, there no, there's no meristematic tissue. There's nothing that's going to change. So where do we find meristematic tissue? Well, this is tissue that's analogous to uh, animal stem cells. And you've all heard about stem cells. What are they? Well, they are cells, you know, in not just human beings, but other animals that can become other types of cells. They're not, yeah, both meristematic and stem cells are like teenagers. They don't know what they're going to be till they grow up. So we can find them in plants, meristematic tissue, the root tips. We can find it stem buds, and we can find it with stem cambium. So a little short galling segue here, and I'm just going to cover this very briefly and very quickly because I want to talk about this meristematic tissue, for example, in tree stems. So we look straight down on the tree trunk. That's kind of what you're looking at right there. And this is probably a review for most. This is, you know, start with a ring of bark to the outside. Beneath that is this ring of phloem. Uh, then we have this very thin ring of cambium. And then we have the wood of the tree made up of multiple rings called xylem. And of course, we always say food flows through phloem. So sugars and carbohydrates flow down and up. And those are derived from photosynthesis. So that's the, that's the food flows through phloem. 
Now, if you look at the xylem, that, as I said earlier, is the wood of the tree. Part of it's the wood of the tree. Provides structural support. It is what we make lumber out of, except if it's rotted away. But the xylem is not just wood. You also have this sapwood. I love the name sapwood because the sapwood is where we see water and nutrients flowing up the tree through the through the xylem. So that's the part of the xylem where we see vascular flow. If we have several annual rings functional, we call that a diffuse porous tree. If we only have one ring functional, that's called a ring porous tree. Now that's a little off the subject, but this is why emerald ash borer was so destructive because ash trees are ring porous and the larvae were flown feeders, but they couldn't help but etch right into this first ring of xylem. And I think you could see, predict what would happen is the entire plumbing of the tree would be ripped out. But that's a whole different story. So let's go back to this meristematic tissue, the cambium. So the cambium, notice these arrows, which direction they're pointing. So the cambial cells, like teenagers, they don't know what they're going to be until they grow up. They can form phloem to the outside. Those cells can become phloem, or those cells could become xylem to the inside. It's how a tree increases its girth. Other meristematic cells, like I mentioned, at the tips of roots and also at buds. So the buds have meristematic tissue. So meristematic tissue must be involved. And this leads to what I call the meristematic tissue law. So for example, if we look at these buds, well, those buds would normally do what? Well, they would, as meristematic tissue, eventually give rise to leaves or more stem tissue, but they can also be hijacked. Because remember, the meristematic gall law is that the gall maker must use meristematic, they must use tissue that they can direct genes within that tissue, within the individual cells to form unique structures. And that's what's happening with this oak bud gall wasp. But right there's the gall, there's the normal buds. Oak lobe gall, same idea. You look at this and think, what in the world happened? Well, right there were the hijacked buds that then were formed into these gall structures. And once the plant tissue stops differentiating, once there's no meristematic tissue, galls cannot be formed by the gall maker. So for example, you know, this chinkapin oak leaf can no longer give rise to any galls. Neither can these buds up here. They're locked down. There's no, they're not going to give right. But what's inside in this case would be furled up leaf tissue. However, you can see that the hijacking occurred a little earlier. That's important to understand because leaf and bud galls with that meristematic gall law applied means that they are only going to form in the spring. Because what happens later in the season? Well, some plants, some trees will have a second flush of growth. And okay, maybe galls could form a little later. But as a rule, leaf and bud galls only form in the spring. And they just mature through the season. We'll get to that in just a minute. And these can be complicated structures that actually include functional plant organs. For example, on this rough oak bullet gall, why do we see blackening up here? And why is this sticky wet? And again, you know, I like to share this because, you know, I'm teaching this, but I want to really emphasize that the things I'm teaching are things that, you know, I literally stumbled across. I mean, I would see these oak bullet galls and I would see that they had this and it's sticky. I would see this and I would see the dark and it's like, what is going on there? I didn't know originally. I, it was like, oh, I don't know what's happening there. So another galling segue enticed by nectar. Now I'm just going to go far afield just for a second and then we'll bring it back around because for example you all know with pollinators for example I mean you know trees and other plants with flowers with higher uh, order flowers will produce nectar to do what? To entice a pollinator to come in and pick up the pollen and take it somewhere else. I mean, plants are static things. They can't move around. They can't get on a bus and go out you know and have a date 50 miles away, they can't call Uber, they are stuck there. So they use the nectar, as you all know, uh, to involve something to take their pollen to another plant. 
And then once pollination occurs, we can get fruit. We all know that. But now, <laughs> nectar is not just produced in flowers. I need to count this up because uh, when I first came across these extra floral nectaries, uh, I only thought they occurred on prunus. I don't know about you, but when I was taught how to identify members of the genus prunus, cherries, for example, I was always told you can identify them because of these glands at the base of the leaf or on the petiole, somewhere near the base of the leaf. And I was just told they were glands. You know, I wish now looking back, I'd been just a little bit more curious because I just let that go. It was only a plant identification feature, but I never asked, well, glands, what do they do? What kind of glands? So we see this on peach, for example, Kwanzaa cherry, look at that. Now notice something that's happening, happening. extra floral nectaries. Look at this little extra floral nectary. What do you think that droplet is? That's nectar. Now, why do you suppose that cherry tree is doing that? Uh-huh. This ant's showing up to imbibe. It's being pulled in just like a pollinator would be pulled into a flower to imbibe the nectar. Well, what's the value in that? Well, as it turns out, it's related to Eastern tent caterpillar. Eastern tent caterpillars' favorite food are cherries, hands down. They can be found on other trees, yes, but boy, they do love cherries. As it turns out, cherries, ants, and tent caterpillars, timing of nectar production in relation to susceptibility of caterpillars to ant predation. So what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that if we go backwards, once these extra floral nectaries start pumping out nectar, they attract ants, and it's not coincidental. This occurs at about the same time that eastern tent, ooh, I'm going the wrong way, that eastern tent caterpillar eggs are hatching. You tell they're hatching because little pennies pop out, right? No, I'm just making that up. But the point I'm making is that these little caterpillars, they will not survive an ant attack. So it turns out the tree is attracting defenders, ants. And uh, it, as the caterpillars get larger, once they get too large for ants to prey upon them, what happens to the extra floral nectaries? They start shutting down. So these nectars, don't, these extra floral nectaries don't work after oh, about late spring. That's the end of them for that year. Well, now let's go back to why rough oak bullet galls have blackened tips and have sticky stuff on them. Here we see they're newly forming. They're popping through the bark. We'll get to how they form in just a second. In fact, I guess we'll get to it right now. I apologize. <laughs> I thought I had this a little later. So back to our graphic, you know, with looking straight down on the stem, you know, bark phloem, this ring of cambium, pay attention to that. Remember the cambial cells divide to become the phloem and the xylem, but they can also do something else. Take a look at what the wasp is doing with that cambial tissue. Do you see, here's the xylem, here is the phloem, the green here, and right down between is the cambium. So you can see clearly these galls are rising from that cambial tissue. Now I'm gonna plant a seed here, I'm gonna revisit in just a minute, but that tells you that these galls from stem cambium tissue, since the cambial tissue in a stem is active throughout the growing season, as soon as it warms up this spring, well, it already is, uh, that cambial tissue is active and it remains active until the stem basically freezes in the fall. So what that's telling you is unlike galls that are formed from buds, these galls can happen anytime during the growing season. That's a little side, little side note, but the, here's what's happening that you can see. Okay, so these galls are coming from the cambium. So a little bit of behind the scenes on this. The gall-making wasps, remember, is turning plant genes on and off to direct gall growth. That, again, is what's happening here. Again, that's just mind-blowing. I keep saying that. I said it's going to be mind-blowing. So the rough bullet galls, youngest to oldest. And here we see last year's terminal bud scar. So that means these are this year's galls. These are the old galls. And you can see the exit hole from the galls. We open them up, 
And what do we find inside? We find a gall wasp larvae with chewing mouth parts, meaning it's surrounded by nutritive tissue, again, produced under the direction of the gall maker. But here's where things get really wild and interesting. Look at this droplet coming from the tip here and rolling down. That is a nectar droplet. That is an extra floral nectary. And then, of course, since it's sugary, it can become colonized by black sooty molds. Just like what we see uh, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, honeydew produced by aphids and certain sucking insects like soft scale, same idea. The oak bears still another hairy gall, moreover without use, which secretes in the spring a juice resembling honey in taste as well as in touch. Theophrastus, History of Plants, 287 BC. This is not new. People were seeing this for quite some time. But why does the wasp do this? It's because of this. Look at who's showing up to that gall, the stormtroopers. I mean, I have to tell you, if you're a bird bent on pecking open this gall to get that little gall-making meat morsel, you're not going to do that if it's being guarded by these uh, highly aggressive <laughs> bald-faced hornets. I mean, look at that. Even when the galls are young, they're secreting their extra floor nectaries, uh, secreting nectar to attract hornets. So they're hanging out there. I mean, look at this paper wasp doing the same thing. Oops, let me put that upside down. Stay away from my gall. Now, you notice, I want you to notice something. This is my camera. I didn't use a long lens to take this shot. I got pretty close to this wasp. And when you see a wasp, rising up on its back legs and looking at you like this. Uh, that's telling you, no, you better back away. I was a little too close. But that's because that gall, that gall is being protected by that wasp. That's the whole idea. Yellow jackets, I mean, everything shows up to them. And ants. 1984, mutualism between a snippet gall wasp and ants. They likewise will defend the gall maker. Same when you see this with uh, the bud galls I mentioned earlier, the oak bud galls. The ecological and evolutionary importance of nectar secreting galls. You know, the scientific literature has gotten pretty good with some of these relationships. What it hasn't gotten good with, though, is research describing exactly how galls are produced. I have to just tell you that. It's a little frustrating to me because I keep thinking, you know, if we could unlock the secrets, think what we could learn about plant physiology and by the way, so far, no person, no scientist has ever created a gall without the use of a gall maker. We've never unlocked the whole secrets going on there. Gall structures and locations that are a plant are so species specific, you can identify the gall maker without seeing the gall maker. This bad hair day oak gall, which is actually called the hairy oak leaf gall, that's only produced by one species, Calaritis ferva. I don't even have to open that up. I don't have to see the female wasp. I don't have to see the, I don't have to see the adults to identify the gall maker. They're that specific. Clustered oak midrib gall, Andricus dimorphus is the only wasp that produces that gall. The cypress twig gall midge only produces this gall on bald cypress, although it should be called the bald cypress leaf gall midge, right? Don't you think? These are not being formed on twigs, they are being formed on leaves. But nonetheless, only that midge fly produces that gall on bald cypress. But galls do change over time. I mentioned this earlier, they do through the season mature, and you need to be aware of that in terms of identifying galls, like large, op op uh, large empty oak apple gall. I've already shown you this once before. I've always found these fascinating. I, I want to just, okay, oak apple. Notice the little dots on there, and I've kind of got a magnified here. Uh, I, I mean, this gall maker takes it to the next step because they sort of remind me of uh, like plum curculio damage on, a, on an apple. I don't know if that's what the gall maker was going for, but they do look like a, an apple that even has you know, some of the challenges on the surface. At least I always thought that. But if we open it up, again, we see this intricate structure inside. Eventually, though, once that gall maker matures, 
once it pupates and emerges as a, an adult, a wasp in this case, the gall will change colors. It'll start turning brown and there's the exit hole. So you go from this very green to this very brown. This occurs usually sometime about midsummer. They, they get this over with pretty quickly because once again, this is a leaf gall. And so they cannot form on leaves later in the season because remember, this gall maker has to use the meristematic tissue from the leaf bud. And again, this is the same gall once it's matured and the gall maker has left. A little bit about oak apple galls. You know, this is a general term. Uh, you'll hear people say, well, that's an oak apple gall. Well, that, that's, they're all produced by snippet wasps, but there are about 26 different species at, at, very, at the very least that produce the so-called oak apple galls. They will vary in overall appearance, appearance and size and internal structure. So some are speckled like I showed before and smooth. Some are bumpy, not speck, speckled. Some are highly filamentous, some less so. These are not, this isn't a young form of what will become this gall. It's very obvious. This is a mature oak apple gall produced by one wasp species. And this is an immature, I mean, it's still developing, obviously produced by another. So these aren't produced by the same species. And this is just younger gall. These are different species. And of course, they both turn brown. This is a little bit later, uh, some of the same dolls, again, just showing that as they mature, they're, they're, they're turning brown, they're changing colors. Gall maker life cycles, though, can be very complicated. Now, this is something that, quite frankly, was not known too many years ago. It was known for certain gall makers, but not across the board. So we're going to use the horned oak gall as the poster child. Uh, the life cycle was worked out very well by a graduate student at the University of Kentucky uh, called uh, Eileen Esiason. Uh, she was, for those of you who know, University of Kentucky and Department of Entomology, uh, Dr. Dan Potter, fantastic entomologist. Eileen was his graduate student. So we're going all the way back, frankly, into the 19, now uh, let's see, I guess probably late 1990s, early 2000s. They worked out the life cycle for this gall maker. And as it turns out, a very similar life cycle exists for the uh, <clears throat> Uh, rough oak bullet galls, and it's kind of becoming learned that stem gall makers have this type of life cycle, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's first go back to the meristematic tissue law and recognize that, okay, the meristematic cambial cells divide, become the phloem and xylem, but they can also be hijacked. In this case, they're hijacked by this gall, uh, this wasp gall maker uh, to produce the structure from the cambium. I want to stress that. So unlike bud galls, they can occur anytime the grow, uh, during the growing season. That's important. So here we have an immature horned oak gall. We open it up, and this is one of the very few galls that kind of falls into the category of being a bit destructive. Now, I am pausing because the, I've never seen this gall maker kill a tree. I mean, it can make oak trees look so bad, you might wish they were die, they were dead, but uh, I've never seen it cause so much harm you now that the tree dies. Very, very few gall makers are capable of that. In fact, if you really press me, I can't really think of a single one that is a tree killer. But at any rate, it can deform trees because you can see there's a general rule of thumb. If it is a stem gall, that only occurs on the surface of the stem like rough oak bullet gall, no harm, no foul. If it is a stem gall though that fully encircles the stem and incorporates the vascular tissue totally in the gall structure, this disorganized vascular tissue can disrupt water flow. So here you have water going in, it goes into the gall, gets used up, and you can see, look at this dehydrated stem beyond. Look, that's normal. Water is not making it out here. So you can get stem dieback from beyond the gall. So here we have an old spent gall. You know, it's fully matured. The wasp has already left. And then we have active galls. This is where things get to be a little complicated. 
The wasp larvae in these active galls are in there for 33 months. <clears throat> and what's important, what emerges from these galls are all females. So inside that gall, you have, a, a and again, there's Dan Potter. So I wanted you to notice that source. I already mentioned Dan. Um, so here you have an empty chamber. You have the gall wasp uh, chamber with the larva. You have succulent tissue, and oh, looky there, there's that nutritive tissue. But I want you to focus on this horn-like structure. There it is in real life. Remember what I told you, you know, you can learn a lot just by cutting these galls open and seeing what's inside. Now, these are woody galls, so yes, I had to use a pair of clippers to do this and very, very careful about it, but you, there they are. There are those horns, these horns embedded in the gall. Here they are a little further along. If you look closely, right there is the wasp chamber. Let's go back. The chamber where the gall wasp is living, right there. Now, eventually what happens after 33 months, after the gall-making wasp is about to pupate, so it's about to emerge as a female, you heard that noise. You can hear him do that. Actually, what happens is the horn pops to the surface. Well, why is that such a good thing? Well, that then makes it so that we have very close to the surface, the opening to the outside where the females can emerge. Now, in this case, <clears throat> I keep saying that these are female. They are, they're all females. They can produce eggs without the need to be mated. That's called parthenogenesis. And of course, we see that in a lot of insects, right? I mean, quite honestly, you know, you see this in, in such a range of insects, sometimes we forget that can occur. A lot of aphids do that. A lot of insects, uh, you know, I guess the guys listening probably think, well, I hope that's an evolutionary dead end. You know, <laughs> you don't need any guys. Now, these females that emerge, though, I want to tell you something a little about them. First of all, they are all females, but they are very poor flyers. As a matter of fact, Dan used to say, you almost, I mean, you almost couldn't fly. You'd say, you know, so they emerge and they crawl. So here we have, you know, the horns popping open. Now, notice something on the tips of these horns. That is sweet, sticky stuff. Now, I used to think, okay, you see these droplets? That's nectar. I used to believe that, uh, that they were useful to attracting defenders, but I've never seen a wasp or a hornet or anything come to these galls. So I talked to Dan about this some years ago, like what is going on there? And he and Eileen uh, became convinced that what's actually happening is these females come out and they are imbibing on the nectar to give them energy so they can crawl up the stem. And what do they crawl up the stem and then do? Well, <clears throat> it happens that they emerge as leaf buds begin to expand. When there's meristematic tissue available, and then those females give rise to leaf galls. So you have this alternation, you know, alternating, alternating between two different lifestyles in this insect. Now, the resulting wasps that form in these leaf galls, number one, it only takes them about three months for this to occur. So now we're talking three months. I mean, we're probably talking about sometime and I think, I think the, the horns start typically popping forward sometime in late April to early May. Three months later, then you're talking well up into summer, right? Now, what emerges from these galls, and each one just has an individual larva, are males and females. So from the stem galls, you only get females. And they only go to the leaves on that tree because they really don't fly very well. But these females can fly very well. And there are males, so they can actually fly off the tree, go someplace else. So just to kind of reemphasize, this is called heterogamy. And it means you have this alternation between different lifestyles. Now, why am I bringing this to the foreground? I mean, what, what's the big deal? Well, first of all, this is, I've never seen this synchronous on an oak tree. Sometimes you'll see, I mean, every year you will have some leaf galls. And then you'll have subsequently, you know, different age stem galls every year. So it's not synchronized. 
And then this also means if you told a person, well, just, you know, trim off all the, uh, the, the stem galls. If it's during the summer and you did that, you would still have leaf galls to give rise to more stem galls. And you wouldn't want to defoliate the tree. That'd defeat the purpose. What am I trying to say? Well, because of this complicated heterogamy, this makes controlling this, managing this, suppressing it to be extremely, well, the word is actually problematic. That's the word for this. And that's going to be a recurring theme here in just a minute. So as I said earlier, heterogamy also occurs with rough oak bullet galls. So this leads us right to gall management. What should we do? Well, the first gall truth relative to management is gall makers are so host specific, even a slight change in tree selection can avoid the problem. Let me sink, let that sink in just a minute. Why are they so host specific? Because remember, they have to be able to turn their host genes on and off at just the right time to grow the galls. And if they're confronting a host that they're not matched up to be able to produce chemicals to turn those genes on and off, nothing happens. And the gall, you know, all's lost. The gall maker would not have the ability uh, to produce another generation. So this is, I mean, frankly, I consider this to be something we should be dancing about. And a good example is this. Now, as far as I know, these pin oak trees uh, are, well, okay, let me back up. I shouldn't say as far, I do know this. I know that these trees all came from one nursery. They almost, they almost all came out of the same row. That much we know. So we know they're pin oaks. We know they're not different varieties or cultivars. They're, they're the straight species. But notice something here. And this is this has continued for, oh my goodness, I, I think I first saw these trees about 15 years ago. Out of all the rows of this of these trees, and by the way, there's one right over here. Actually, there's a, a gap, uh, I should say, right here is a road, an entrance road. And then there are more of these from the same batch of trees. There's only one out of all these trees that is susceptible to the horned oak gall wasp. Now, what is that telling you? It's telling us that <clears throat> the susceptibility is... <laughs> is matched to the individual genetics within a tree species. In other words, the slight variability even within a single tree species can mean that the gall maker won't be matched to its host trees and you won't see the development of galls. So, but let's turn it on its head a little bit to say this. Once you have the wasp tuned in to a particular host, you can't untune it. So in other words, I've never, and I, I need to go out again. It's actually been a couple of years since I visited these trees, but I would, they're not far from my home and I'd visit them every year. I've never found galls on any of these trees other than this one. But maybe eventually over time I might. And then of course, you know, I might find a few more the next year, a few more the next year. So in essence, the host selects its gall maker. A final truth, galls may house other occupants that have nothing to do with gall formation. These interlopers still rely on the galls for their lodging. They're called inquilines, which is derived from the Latin inquilus, uh, inquilinus, rather, which means tenant or lodger. So here's a good example, horned oak gall, once again, horns popping forth, and then you cut one open, you find, my gosh, there is a big pupa in there. That's way too big to be the wasp pupa. And matter of fact, you know, this gall is spent. It's not being used anymore. And if you know anything about pupae, this is actually a moth pupa. So it turns out, and here we see a little bit different. It turns out, and you know, here's the pupal skin hanging out, and there's the moth, the oak gall boar, Synanthodon decipiens. Beautiful little moth. It's not a gall maker. It just comes in and makes a living on the gall. So sometimes you have to be a little careful. You have to know that's what's going on. Um, and in a way, though, this also makes the galls, quite frankly, you almost have to look at them as, as little ecosystems. Because as a matter of fact, with horned oak gall, I believe, don't hold me to this, but I think there's something like 32 or 36, I should have that number in my head, different arthropods that make a living on that gall beyond the gall-making wasp. So quite a few, 
quite a few things living off of that gall. Well, time flies like an arrow. I see it's eight o'clock, but fruit flies like a banana. And as you know now, gall wasps like oak trees. So some final galling points. This is the good news and bad news about galls. Here's the bad news. Once initiated, the gall process is almost impossible to stop and little is known about most gall makers. Little is known about insecticide uh, efficacy. I mean, quite frankly, I should change that. Almost nothing is known. Now, why is that? You might say to yourself, well, why don't we have people doing work to try to you know, find out how to manage these things. Well, the reason's pretty straightforward. It rests with how much damage do these actually cause plants? You know, we would like to think that people are using insecticides only when whatever it is that they're targeting can cause harm to the health, the overall health of that tree, for example, or that plant. It's not what it makes the plant look like. We shouldn't spray based on aesthetics. It should be uh, we should make applications based on improving the health. And I'm talking about improvements. I'm talking about saving the plant. So, you know, uh, gypsy moth can certainly stress oak trees hands down. But quite frankly, you know, it takes a lot of successive years of heavy defoliation before we start seeing trees truly in trouble. One season of defoliation, eh, it's not likely to do it unless the tree is already in trouble. So there's really no reason to <coughs> uh, spend the time and energy and effort and so forth to do efficacy studies to control galls when they don't cause any harm to their hosts. And prevention is often impractical based on an, uh, or impossible. I mean, you look at the horned oak galls. Yeah, if you pruned everything off and just leave the main stem, yeah, I guess you control them. But again, it's not practical. Here's the good news, though. <clears throat> the vast majority of galls cause little or no harm to the overall health of their host. <coughs> Excuse me just for a second here. I have to get a drink of water. So they don't really cause any harm to the health of their host. <coughs> oh, I wanted to show this. <coughs> Look at these galls. This is horned oak gall. You know, you saw this picture before. <clears throat> there's after the tree full, uh, fully leaves out. I don't see any evidence of galls there. <clears throat> and here's a very important thing. Year-to-year <clears throat> -year populations of gall makers can rise and fall dramatically. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, <clears throat> this would actually interfere with doing insecticide efficacy trials because and you may have seen this if you watch galls. I mean, some years, leaf galls, for example, some years, that bad hair day gall, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, even national, it even made national news, with these things falling off oak trees. That was, I think, two years ago. I have not seen those numbers since. And that's, that's a very odd thing. And that's actually throughout Ohio. You'll see these, the same gall kind of rising up in Southern Ohio at the same time we're seeing it in the central part of the state and up your way. I don't know how that works, quite frankly, but I've always found it kind of fascinating. But the point being is, let's say you do spray a tree and then the next year, no galls. Well, can you conclude the insecticide eliminated the gall makers or did just nature cause the populations to go down? There's no way of knowing. So that's kind of an important point with these. But again, even a slight change in the host can eliminate the problem. But here's the good news. I hope I've convinced you galls are just fascinating. These intricate structures, they're mind blowing. Just they really will blow your mind if you think about it just a little bit. Insect galls are obvious and frequently excite surprise because of the strange form or the wonderful coloring and delicacy of structure. Ephraim Porter Felt was, is I consider the guy to be like the father of of known gall information in North America. He published The Key of American Insect Galls in 1917. His last update on this book was in 1947. So Felt really worked to help us to understand galls. Uh, and I really love his quote. That's exactly how we should view them. 
they really should excite surprise because they are just so strange. And they represent something that we that's poorly understood and should be receiving further, further research, in my opinion. Well, we'll put galls to rest. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Boy, that's really a, I heard you guys were. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you for that presentation. That was very fascinating. I mean, that makes me want to go outside and uh, cut the goal that I have. So there, there you go. I've done yeah. my job then. Another goal maniac. Yeah. <laughs> so Sarah's going to take care of the questions today. Uh, All if you right. Have questions. Um, just go ahead and uh, type them in the chat. Okay. I guess we'll just start at the very top, right? Can you? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's like looking in two mirrors, isn't it? <laughs> All right, we'll just start at the top if that's okay, okay. Sarah. I'm looking at the chat. Um, let's look down yeah, in. Uh, yeah. Uh, difference between burls and galls? Well, again, you know, uh, I think, I hope I answered that. We don't know what causes burls, and there's never been identified a cause for burls. However, we can clearly identify what causes a gall. I mean, if we couldn't identify what causes it, it's not a gall. That's kind of fundamental. They are produced by living organisms. Oh, I full support of a gall series. I like this. Uh, let me go on down. Do you think abnormal structures like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I love Brussels sprouts. Do you think abnormal structures like Brussels sprouts were first derived as galls and then selected for? Well, remember, Brussels sprouts are, are flowering structures. So uh, they're only abnormal if you don't like them, right? Is that what I'm hearing? I'm interested in the mite galls. Those are what I'm seeing in my yard. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, that's Mary Hart. Uh, <clears throat> the area five galls, as I said, I, I I used to include that in this presentation, but you kind of, it's easy to go far afield with area five galls. They really do deserve, in my opinion, you know, their, their own presentation because of their diversity uh, and complexity. Uh, nope, most galls don't photosynthesize, but those that do still depend on import from the rest of the plant. Well, I don't know. I don't know why Jack would say that. If they are green, they are have photosynthetic equipment. So they are producing sugars, hands down. Uh, some galls do import, but, you know, here's something to keep in mind when we talk about this uh, shifting of carbohydrates. I hope you all know that you know, a healthy oak, healthy maple uh, actually produces a surplus of carbohydrates in order to really, I mean, uh, account for loss of the machinery uh, because they do get fed upon and so on and so forth. So it's not just a balancing act that if you lose a few leaves, the tree is lost. So I would suggest that probably even a tree like uh, I showed you with the oak with a lot of the horned oak galls, Yes, they're not photosynthesizing, and yes, they are drawing on resources from the tree, but I would suggest it's, a, it's, it's not causing great harm to the health of that tree. Are any galls good to eat by humans? Hmm. <clears throat> I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, some of the leaf galls, like the jumping oak galls, are fed upon by squirrels. Uh, they, you know, in other words, as they drop from the tree, many uh, leaf galls will drop from trees when the gall makers are about to pupate. And we do see squirrels in particular going after a number of different types of galls that way. As a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> I've taken pictures of very obvious squirrel damage to even galls, you know, larger galls up on the tree. And you can see the teeth marks, the two grooves, uh, where they're not eating the gall though, I think they're actually going after the gall maker, that little meat morsel inside. Uh, squirrels will eat meat. So I think that's what's happening. Uh, go on down. I've been fascinated by these. Oops. Do populations rise and fall because the galls have a multi-year life cycle? Well, remember, not all the galls I'm talking about have a multi-year life cycle. 
Uh, the vast majority of leaf galls, and I, I'm, I'm being kind of careful about this because what we're discovering is that that some of the leaf galls, which we thought only cycled, you know, each year, you know, to leaves, we are discovering they are now connected to some of the stem galls. However, hands down, like for example, I mentioned the jumping oak gall. Uh, those are those are, are those only have a single uh, years. Uh, they only take one year to develop, and those galls will cycle dramatically from year to year. I don't have an answer as to why that occurs. Because here's the other part of the problem. You know, uh, Amy Stone, for example, you know, in your neck of the woods, I mean, she may be seeing a lot of a certain leaf gall. At the same time, down here in Cincinnati, I'm seeing a lot of the same leaf gall. How can that be? So I think it just goes back to, we have such a poor understanding of these things. Um, it may be, and I'm just throwing this out there, <clears throat> it may be that it has to do with, even though we may see the same leaf gall year after year, but the numbers are way up and the numbers are way down. And this may be what you're getting at with the multi-year life cycle. It may be that some of these gall makers <clears throat> can go into the ground. A lot of them do pupate in the soil. It may be that they go into pupation and it may be that they stay there for, you know, a number of years as pupae. Now that's one thing that's been suggested by others, uh, and it's you know uh, you could speculate that could that could explain it. You know that uh, just sort of like periodical cicadas, you know, 17 years to complete their development. Well, maybe some of these gall makers uh, do the same thing, although that's not quite the right analogy because the periodical cicada nymphs still feed through 16 years, but. I, again, that's pure speculation, but that has been uh, speculated. Uh, let's go on down. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, Jeremy picked up on something. Yeah, that clear wing moth, that's called a clear wing moth. <clears throat> Uh, it is all the clear wing moths belong to a family called Sociidae, uh, and Sociidae is uh, uh, populated by species that uh, that do mimic wasps. As a matter of fact, there's an ash lilac borer, there's a lilac borer, there's two different species. And I will tell you, those moths, when they fly, are dead ringers for, uh, for paper wasps. They even dangle their legs. So uh, I should have said that it's you know clear wing moths are kind of a uh, family society, uh, pretty fascinated. They're dominated also by wood borers. Most of them do bore into some type of a wood, uh, into wood. Do you know of any books for identifying galls? Oh man, uh, Danielle, I wish I did. Uh, that is a real problem, uh, and partially the reason has to do with just the, the utter lack of total research on galls. Um, uh, it's, 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 we just do not have enough knowledge, uh, to, in my opinion, I'm thinking and probably will do it some type of a bulletin, for example, I've talked to some of my extension colleagues, uh, that are interested just to, you know, the known galls, the ones that I've shown here tonight or this evening, for example, <clears throat> But if you, again, go back to 800 different types of galls that we can find on oaks, and that's, and that's no doubt underestimated, uh, underreported. But if we just go to that, that's, that's only, and 700 snippet wasp galls only on oaks. Well, what about all those that occur on hickory, which are, you know, actually very few wasp galls on hickory, but uh, mostly psyllids and, and phylloxera. Phylloxera is a big one on hickory. And midge flies are big on hickory. I think you know where I'm heading with this. It's just that that it's difficult to find particularly trees without an array of galls. And uh, <clears throat> and there's so little known about all of these all of these species that uh, I've 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 looked at it, I've looked into it. Uh, there are some books on galls. The better ones come out of Europe, but how does that help us? Because, you know, those are not native to the United States. 
although I suspect some are now found in the United States, but I can't really give you a good reference. I'm sorry for that. Um, Online, if you go to a website called Bug Guide, it's spelled just like it sounds, Bug Guide, one word, uh, it has gotten a lot better. There's been a lot more contributions. Uh, Bug Guide, despite it sound, uh, sound it sounds like it's kind of, you know, just Bug Guide's actually managed and, and, uh, and, uh, and overseen very largely by professional entomologists. So it's a pretty good source, not just for galls, but identifying other insects and mites. But, they, but that has gotten a lot better in recent years as being a, uh, an on, online resource. Just to kind of keep on this topic just a little longer than I probably should have, the downside is how often you run across <clears throat> so-called identifications online that are com complete misses. I mean, you know, a wasp gall being identified as a midge gall, that's, that's really bad. I mean, it, I can understand mistaking some very similar wasp galls, for example. I can understand, you know, 26 different species that we know of and minimally of oak apple galls. I can understand, you know, maybe the species being a little bit mixed up there. I can get that. Uh, but, you know, if you're calling a gall produced by a wasp that's produced by a midge, or did I say that right? If a wasp gall is actually produced by a midge, uh, that is not helpful. And so I do have some concern, concerns over that relative to uh, the web. We, 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 some, we see a lot of mistaken identities. Well, I don't have, I mean, I think I made it through everything. Everybody's quiet. Uh, I did want to uh, touch on Jeremy's question about this being uh, available online. Uh, I'd encourage all of you to subscribe to our Facebook channel, uh, Wild Ones of Opings Region. Uh, that's where we post the videos uh, after our um, after these presentations are done. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if anyone else has any questions, <laughs> sorry, um, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to either unmute yourself or um, or type in the chat. You know, I do want to ask this question going all the way back to my introduction. Uh, I, uh, Paul, I don't know if, I mean, Amy's on here now. I just want to reiterate who I work for, Paul, right? That's right. <laughs> work for Amy Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, we worked that out beforehand. That was in my official introduction. So the bottom line is, if this presentation was poorly received, well, Amy also has trained me on teaching, so <laughs> she's, I don't know if she can unmute herself, maybe won't let her. <laughs> I, I really like that idea of, um, like you talked about maybe a field trip or something like that. I think that'd be something that we could stay in contact with, and uh, I think that'd be really interesting. Uh, I, I think uh, part of the presentation um, over uh, us being muted and whatnot was, um, I, I would have loved to see it in person because there was a lot of comedy in there, and I, I very much enjoyed that as well. So I want to thank you for that. You have to when you're talking about goals. Let's face it. I mean, you know, that could be a snoozer pretty fast. Yeah, I would love to come up and uh, and, and do something like that. I mean, Amy and I can work together on putting something like yeah. that together. Uh, it is better to go out and see these in real life, and it's also kind of fun. I mean, here's what I think is so fun about it is how often you discover just a brand new thing. So if, if you're all out there and we're all walking around, wow, you know, I've never seen that on oak or I've never seen that on maple. Uh, and then taking pictures and trying to figure out if we can identify and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think the range of galls you can find, you know, in early to midsummer is pretty incredible. My main point in all this is just don't walk past them. Uh, you know, oaks, Amy will tell you this firsthand, you know, that uh, you can spend an hour easily on an oak tree, easily, and it's amazing how often you'll be looking and looking, and then, you know, another gall comes into focus, something you hadn't expected. So, uh, so yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Well, I think we probably held eight people on long enough, right? I, yeah, I guess so, but I, I want to reiterate, thank you again. That was a wonderful presentation. and Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. And thank you guys all for attending. And uh, like I said, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, not, not today, but somewhat shortly. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for, for having me uh, teach this. I'm, I'm glad I was able to do it. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.